Hello and welcome. My name is Carrie Kupak and I'm legal counsel and communications director for Alliance Defending Freedom. Alliance Defending Freedom is the world's largest religious freedom legal advocacy organization and our mission is pretty simple. We advocate for the rights of all people to be able to peacefully and freely live, speak and work according to their faith and conscience. ADF has found ourselves a lot at the Supreme Court in recent years, and uh, we're blessed to have won five cases in the last three years alone, which was and is the inspiration for this particular event series. I know we're anxious to get started and hear from our esteemed Supreme Court experts on this panel, but before I briefly introduce each of them, I'd like to give a short overview of Masterpiece Cake Shop, which is the primary focus of today's panel. And no, despite the many inquiries I've received this week, we will not be serving wedding cake as part of today's lunch. Sorry to disappoint you on that front. I think most of us would agree that Masterpiece Cake Shop is one of the most critical cases on free speech and religious liberty we've seen before the Supreme Court in some time. The implications are significant. And the facts are fairly simple. Cake designer Jack Phillips has owned Masterpiece Cake Shop, a shop in Lakewood, Colorado for many years. He has always been an artist, having developed a love for art and artistic technique from a young age. Shortly after high school, he discovered, discovered he, could he could blend his love for art and culinary art and ultimately open Masterpiece. He chose that particular name for his shop based off a scripture verse, and its logo is an artist's palette with paint brushes. A devout Christian, Jack keeps his shop closed on Sundays and operates his business to the best of his ability in a way consistent with his faith. He serves all customers who walk through his shop's doors. When two gentlemen came to his shop asking him to design a custom cake for their wedding ceremony, Jack politely declined, offering to sell them anything else in his shop. The reason for his declining of this opportunity was his Christian religious convictions on marriage, convictions which have been the consistent basis for his declining of other opportunities throughout the years for custom requests that had nothing to do with marriage, but because those custom requests would violate the teachings of his faith. The two gentlemen sued Jack under Colorado's laws, and now here we are at the Supreme Court. So there's a lot to discuss about this case and other cases, so without further ado, here is our panelist lineup for today. And if you'd like to learn more about each of them, their bios are, have been provided in your program. You can just flip them over, and you can read a little bit more about each of them. First, we have Kristen Wagner. Kristen is Senior Vice President of U.S. Legal Division um, at Alliance Defending Freedom. She is counsel of record for cake designer Jack Phillips, and she will be the one arguing Masterpiece Cake Shot at the Supreme Court. She is also counsel of record for Washington floral designer Baronel Stutzman in the Arlene's Flowers case. Scott Keller, Office of the Attorney General of Texas. He is the Solicitor General. Uh, Scott regularly appears before the Supreme Court on behalf of Texas, and he argued the historic DACA immigration case, United States v. Texas, just last year. Louise Melling, Deputy Legal Director and Director of Center for Liberty at the uh, I've seen this just American Civil Liberties Union, otherwise known as ACLU. The ACLU represents David Mullins and Charlie Craig in Masterpiece Cake Shop. In addition to Louise's extensive legal background, you will often see her quoted in various media outlets for all of the significant First Amendment cases, and it is certainly our pleasure to have her join us here today. Yaakov Roth is a partner here at Jones Day. He had quite the trip coming up the elevator to join us <laughs> for, this, for this event. Yaakov's appellate and Supreme Court experience ranges from protecting the religious freedom rights of death row inmates, pressing a First Amendment challenge to an Ohio law prohibiting false campaign statements, and successfully representing former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell against political corruption charges. Our moderator today is Lawrence Hurley. He is the Supreme Court correspondent for Reuters. Would you please join me in welcoming our panelists? I'd just like to thank uh, Kerry for giving us such a, a good introduction and allowing me to not have to go through all the details of the case. Um, and I, I won't take up too much time before we get straight into it. And uh, obviously, we have lawyers on both sides in Master Case, so that's a a great opportunity for us to hear directly from both sides in that case. I would just say one thing that, you know, as a journalist, this case um, is fascinating in part because it has these dueling narratives, and depending on which uh, of those narratives that you're sort of sympathetic to may, may indicate, you know, how you view this case. Um, so obviously, you know, from the ADF perspective, it's seen mainly as a, as a, a speech case and a, and a, a religious conscience case. Um, but from the perspective of the ACLU, obviously they see this as just being a basic uh, 
example of discrimination and, and uh, how the court wrestles with that is obviously going to be very interesting. So without further ado, uh, I'll ask Kristen to get us started uh, on Masterpiece and then Louise can, uh, can weigh in afterwards. Well, good afternoon. One of America's greatest contributions to the world has been its broad protection of free expression and free exercise. And I would say if we want to have that freedom for ourselves, then we also need to be able to extend it to other people, including those that we disagree with on critical issues. That's been the beauty of our, jurispr our jurisprudence, and it is something that our Constitution affirms and protects. The Supreme Court, as well as President Obama, have both said that people of goodwill are on both sides of the marriage debate. We certainly believe that to be true. And the Supreme Court in Obergefell, the same-sex marriage decision, has said that the, those who believe marriage is between a man and a woman have decent and honorable philosophical and religious premises that they're relying on. We also know that as we move through the next, this issue, that this issue transcends marriage in many ways and impacts also our ability to freely exercise our religion and live out our convictions. So from ADF's perspective, and I think certainly Jack Phillips and Baron L. Stetsman of Arlene's Flowers, what's at stake here is whether expressive professionals will continue to have the right to create artistic expression that's consistent with their convictions. And before I finish, I, I want to make sure that it's clear that the Supreme Court has said that artistic freedom, the freedom that the free speech uh, provides extends beyond words and symbols to visual art. Uh, the Supreme Court has said even things we might not recognize, we might not understand what the message is in a painting, or we might not really appreciate nude dancing or tattoos, but all of those things are protected. And that's certainly true in the case of Jack, who is designing custom cakes for a religious ceremony. He sketches, he sculpts, and he paints and then he often attends that ceremony to deliver the cake. And that final product, that creation that he has built his canvas and painted on is artistic expression that also has spiritual significance to him and to millions of other Americans. So the bottom line for us is we're looking for balance here. This isn't a zero-sum game. It shouldn't be a zero-sum game because marriage is different. And we want the right for all people, all creative professionals, to be able to express themselves consistent with their convictions, even if we disagree with those convictions. Louise? So I wholly agree with Lawrence that this is, in many ways, a story of competing narratives. So this case isn't about a cake. This case is a, about fundamental questions about how our nation will, what the court will decide about our anti-discrimination laws, whether the court will continue to commit to the principles that are embodied in those and that we have held true to for decades now. In essence, when you, when you think about the claims that are being advanced here, they really are a claim that the Constitution confers a right to be exempt from anti-discrimination laws. The Constitution confers a right to be exempt a con a constitutional, a constitutional right to be exempt from anti-discrimination laws, which is really a claim that the Constitution protects discrimination in this case and the other cases that would be covered by the fundamental principles here. In that way, I think the one sentence I'll say that I think everybody will agree with is, this is an incredibly significant case in terms of what the court decides going forward. And uh, Texas has uh, filed an, an amicus brief in this case supporting Masterpiece. Um, I noted when I was looking at it the other day that it cites to um, uh, a couple of pu interesting publications. One is called The Artistry and History of Cake Decorating. Um, and another one is called Having Your Cake and Eating It Too, <laughs> Intellectual Property Protection for Cake Design. So f my first question for Scott is how much he's learned about uh, making cakes. Uh, <laughs> so much more than I ever knew before. Uh, and you know, the uh, men and women in the Texas Solicitor General's office and the research they put into that, I'm, I'm very proud uh, to be able to display that. But I think that the complexity of this, though, and the fact that there have been all of these books, there's reality TV shows, there, there are courses in colleges design or to talk about cake designing, that this isn't simply just a white sheet cake or, or a commodity or a food product. I mean, this is expression. I think it, it's also a little helpful to you know, even simplify the case a little bit. I mean, I would think, I'm about to put words in your mouth, so tell me if I'm putting words I'll that should them. not be there. Okay. 
I would think that if someone went to a painter and said, I want to commission you to paint a painting of my wedding, that that would clearly, beyond any doubt, be expression that the free speech clause would say, you cannot compel a painter to paint. Now, maybe you disagree with that premise. If you disagree with that premise, I would suggest that you have a different view of the free speech clause than I think every justice of the Supreme Court for the last few decades. If you do believe, though, that the free speech clause does not allow government to compel a painter to paint a painting, well, now all we're doing is talking about a commissioned cake and is this of the same nature that a painting would be? And that's a fundamentally different question, though, than you know, is there an exemption from anti-discrimination laws? I mean, the constitutional rights of free speech, no matter, you can pitch it as an anti-discrimination law, you can pitch it as a speech law, however you, however you would pitch that. The bottom line is, if this is a burden on expression, the First Amendment doesn't allow it. So this isn't... What this is, is not a case where somebody called and asked for a particular commission. That's not what the anti-discrimination law reaches. What's at stake here is a business that opened its doors to the public, and the business chose to have a product. The question is, once you have a product, once you say, I have cupcakes, once you say, I'll sell wedding cakes, once you say, I'll sell dresses, what the anti-discrimination law says is you can't make, you can't pick and choose to whom you sell that. We don't say that as a bake shop, you have to make a cake. We don't say as a bake shop that you have to make cupcakes. But if you are going to have that product and you are going to open your doors as a store to the public, then you can't pick and choose to whom you're going to sell that. You can't choose to sell only your cakes to heterosexuals. You can't choose to sell only to white people. You can't choose to sell only to Muslims once you're selling that cake. If we want to think about some of the First Amendment angles, um, I know this will be provocative, but here goes, in the sense that the, there have been other free speech challenges to anti-discrimination laws. And in the Supreme Court case of Rumsfeld, one of the things the court says there is, the fact that anti-discrimination laws required you to take down a sign, words, that said whites only doesn't transform this case into a free speech case. This is about who. You guys, I understand why, like ADF is focusing on the cake. We're focusing on the, as the law does, the law is regulating conduct. The law is regulating the conduct of whether I will sell it to you or whether I will sell it to you and what I do, whether I turn you away or whether I treat you fairly and consistently with how I treat other people. And Kristen, do you want to weigh in on that? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, that's not what the law does. Um, and I would first say there are plenty of speech cases, Pacific Gas, uh, Miami Herald. You can go down the list. Hurley, for example. They all say that even laws that generally do regulate conduct, once they start touching on speech or other constitutional rights, we're in a whole other territory. In fact, the Supreme Court has referred to that as being a peculiar way of applying a law. And Hurley is essentially, the ACLU is relitigating the Hurley decision, which said it is not about the who when the parade organizers declined to have the gay and lesbian group in their parade. It wasn't because of who they were, it was because of the message they were expressing. And so in that case, the public accommodation law could not trump their right of free expression. And the same is true here. Neither Jack, nor Baronel Stutzman, nor any case that's being litigated right now in this nation is about the who, it's about the what. It's about what is being celebrated. And we have to recognize, one, we need to protect free expression if we want it for ourselves, and two, marriages, weddings are uniquely different. The Supreme Court has recognized that time and time again. This is about the speech. It's not about incidental conduct of sending logistical emails like the decision of uh, the Rumsfeld decision that was just mentioned. So let's uh, bring in Yaakov, uh, our uh, in-house counsel, so to speak, um, <laughs> about the, how the Supreme Court's actually going to approach this case. And uh, just before I ask you that, you know, I just mentioned 
you know, obviously a lot of focus is going to be on Justice Kennedy, who authored the Obergefell gay marriage decision, in which uh, I'll just read a bit of what he said, where he went out of his way to say that people opposed to same-sex marriage reached that conclusion, quote, quote, reached that conclusion based on decent, honorable, religious, or philosophical premises, and neither they nor their beliefs are disparaged here, which, um, you know, is, is, is a line in the opinion that uh, obviously ADF will, will uh, like. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the dissenters in Obergefell um, uh, didn't really think that Kennedy uh, w meant that, uh, with uh, Justice Alito saying, um, we will soon see whether this proves to be true. I assume that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, employers, and schools. So which way is uh, Justice Kennedy going to see this? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure even Justice Alito realized just how soon we would find out uh, whether Justice Kennedy meant what he said in that quoted language. One of the things that's actually interesting about the case is, in many cases, in the Supreme Court, we see two narratives, one appealing to the conservative side of the court, one appealing to the liberal side of the court. Here we actually have two aspects of Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence that are being pitted against each other because Justice Kennedy is uh, quite well known for his um, strong position in favor of same-sex rights. I mean, going back to Romer and also uh, Lawrence and then Windsor and, and Obergefell, on the other hand, he takes a very expansive view of First Amendment protection and expression and the importance of expression to one's identity and human dignity, all the things that Justice Kennedy really cares about. So this case pits one against the other uh, for him. So I think it's going to be a, a very interesting case to watch the questions that he asks. Uh, if you're asking for a prediction, you know, if I could predict Justice Kennedy, I'd be very rich. Uh, <laughs> and very sought after. <laughs> right. Uh, but if I had to put money on it, my guess is that Justice Kennedy will see this as, as he often does, as a case of government encroachment on individual liberty. Right? The, the other gay rights cases that he's written have really pushed back against what he viewed as government interference, government denigration of a particular part of society. They were all cases where you had uh, the same sex individual or couple against the government and the government lost. Here you have the government pitted against uh, the baker. And I think he's gonna see it in those terms. This is not a case where the government is doing something to um, demean a portion of society uh, in the sense of the uh, same-sex couple. If anything, it's the government demeaning the views of uh, another portion of society that hold uh, different beliefs about the role of marriage. So that's how I would game it out, but don't, don't hold me to it. But Justice Kennedy in Obergefell, he has the quote that, y that you read, and he has the, an another quote in a different section where he says, he also references the sincerity of people's beliefs and the need to respect people, and then it goes on, and I, I don't have it exactly, but he goes on to say, but when the government, when the government then sanctions those, it puts an imprimatur on, I forget what his word is, but with that, uh, that stands more for, that indicates that this is gonna be hard for Justice Kennedy in both directions. That Justice Kennedy, I think, cares deeply about faith. You see that in how he reasoned or how he asked questions in Little Sisters of the Poor, for example. But a Obergefell sends messages about the dignity that he cares deeply about, as you were saying, for LGBT people. It also points to the dignity of people of faith who oppose same-sex marriage, and, but then he has a sentence about the state putting its hand on, on respecting that to the detriment of LGBT couples. So if the state, through the court, puts its hand on creating a hole in the anti-discrimination law, that I think will also create a conflict for him. That there's, he may see, he could see this more as he was, as you're talking about, but he may also see this if he were to rule in favor of Masterpiece 
as a threat to the LGBT legacy in terms of the dignity of people then turned away and denied and his concern, his deep concern about anti-discrimination principles. So last term we had the, the Trinity Lutheran case, another uh, religious uh, rights case, as, as, so to speak, uh, where a lot of people thought originally that was going to be a 5-4 decision um, once the court actually decided it, um, but uh, it, it ended up not being. So is there any chance at all that this case doesn't turn out to be a 5-4? Is there some kind of narrow way that c it could be ruled on it that would get uh, you know, either more than five justices to sign on to it? I think there is. I, th I think there's opportunity for a much broader consensus on the court. Um, and obviously, I think on the, the free speech side of things, um, the fact that a wedding cake is essentially a, a temporary monument that is celebrating the wedding, um, the, the fact that it is artistic expression, there's broad support on the court. Justice Kagan um, has a number of statements about free speech, as does uh, Justice Kennedy. Um, and hopefully Justice Breyer, too. I mean, they, Hurley was a nine to zero decision. If you, if you look at these free speech decisions, and I think Trinity applies here, too. Trinity was a lot about status-based discrimination in the sense of you can't, if you are looking at the who, then that's wrong, and you can't discriminate against someone because they are religious. And when we talk about dignity in this case, we have to consider both sides of that issue. Um, and I think that the, the balances in this case are very different than what we saw in Obergefell. We're permanently ruining people, taking all they own. And I, I'm embarrassed to say it because it seems so surreal, but some people are even faced with jail if they don't create these, this artistic expression. And that's mind-boggling that we're in this state. So I think the, the equities and the dignity harms are very different. I yeah, Scott. I, was a, I, I don't imagine this being something other than 5-4, and I think I think this is different. I think a, a shop on the street, Justice Kennedy, for example, what he does, I, don't, I can't predict, but he will understand that a shop on the street is not the same as a parade. But there has not yet been a case where a speech association or religion claim has prevailed in the context of a chart as a, as a defense to discrimination in the commercial marketplace. So this is a this this question poses very deep question very deep issues on both sides. But one of them is whether we really are going to say that the anti discrimination laws in America have a hole in them for anybody who makes something that's custom made, or for any time it's an expressive event. And the law, I'll, I mean, I'll just say it again: the law is regulating the conduct. It's it's looking at the who. Scott. What I'm hearing is it's okay to compel expression as long as it's in, in the face of anti discrimination. And, and oh, look, I guess if you're skeptical of the position that the state of Texas took in its brief or the position the ADF has taken, ask yourself this Would you be okay with giving the state of Texas the power to compel similar types of expression that someone doesn't want to engage in? Because the, the limiting principle here, it, it cannot just be that these are, there's going to be a different rule for same-sex weddings. I mean, the principles we're talking about here go, much bigger. go far exactly. beyond that. Exactly. I mean, that you know, can, you, can you compel you know, a movie director that if they're going to take a movie on a position of one, they have to make another. They can't turn down uh, that type of movie. Is it writing a press release, doing a 30-second political spot ad? I mean, there are all sorts of examples where that leads to. And I'm, I'm not sure, though, that this case is just about, well, if you have a brick and mortar and you're going to sell products, that therefore you have to then also Com uh, commit to creating custom-made expression. I, I think it'd be a very different case if this were simply a cake was made, it was out at a brick and mortar for sale to the public, held open to s sell to the public, and someone came in and said, I want to buy that, and then the proprietor said, I'm not going to sell that to you because of who you are, because of sexual orientation. But that's not what's, what's going on here. The, the cake is not out there in the shop. It is a multi-hundred dollar cake that there are sketches to be made, there's designs. It, it, is, it is a custom creation that has not been created yet. Um, very briefly, as far as a narrow way to decide the case too, I, on the, not the free speech claim, but the free exercise claim, I mean, a wrinkle of this case that there could be a very narrow decision on is Colorado here fined Jack Phillips for not creating the cake celebrating a same-sex wedding. But that same Colorado Civil Rights Commission allowed other cake designers to refuse to make cakes 
denigrating or opposing same-sex marriage. Whether you call that a viewpoint discrimination on the speech side or you call that a religious gerrymander on the, the free exercise, I think that's one narrow fact of this particular case that you could see something narrower. Let's just start out a few things, though, I think. And so one is, this isn't the same as the insert cases. This is in the sense that the state isn't saying, walking into a store and saying, oh, Jack Phillips, I direct you to make a cake that says, I love Jim and Sam. Jack Phillips has said, I'm making cakes. And he, what the state is saying here is you can't hang a sign up in your window that says, my cakes are for heterosexuals only. Um, this, is, this is about a product and a who, and it is, not the, it is not the state coming in and saying, you must make this particular cake. That's what's different about the other context where the Colorado Civil Rights Commission said, this is about your particular message. This, is, this isn't about a, a category of person protected by the, the Colorado anti-discrimination law. This is about a particular message. The, um, Yeko? Yes, the, the challengers certainly have, uh, I would say... Um, work to narrow? Yeah, work to narrow the issue. I mean, that's not surprising. That's typically what litigants will do in the Supreme Court to try to, uh, gain, try to gain potential for additional votes, right? N narrow the issue. And, the brief that was filed by the federal government, the Solicitor General's brief, really takes pains to emphasize how narrow the issue is, right? It's, we're talking about cakes, and there's a lot of unique things about cakes, and you know, certain other expressive aspects of the wedding ceremony, and that's what gives them additional First Amendment protection, and, you know, but it, wouldn't, it would be different if it were some other uh, service that w were being provided, and, it would be different if it was a different type of discrimination. So there's a lot of narrowing going on. Um, but I think it really, to some extent, it under, that undersells the social problem that is beneath the case, right? The um, thinking about uh, you know, a Jewish example, right? The, if Masterpiece wins this case on a narrow theory, then I suppose the, the rabbi can't be forced to officiate at the same-sex marriage. That would involve speech, you know, he has to give some invocation. But it wouldn't prevent the synagogue from being forced to rent out its banquet hall. That's only if the synagogue otherwise rents its banquet hall yeah, to which, everybody, right? Well, it, it, it does. It let's, say the it, let's say it does. It's, oh, it's generally open. Um, and that, so that would not be covered, I mean, there's no, there isn't really speech there, the way the parties have framed the case, but there's a, I would say, equally or close to equally serious conflict and problem uh, with that for somebody who believes in religious freedom and, and religious conscience rights. You know, I, I was on the board of my synagogue, it would be a real problem if we were faced with that situation. Um, so there's a lot, there is a real bigger social problem that, I think uh, is to some extent being missed by just focusing on aspects of cake making. Well, I think that the, I mean, I'm interested in what you think. I think that the briefs have a little bit of tension on that theory between there's the focus on speech and the making of the cake, and then there's the focus on the importance of the cake at the wedding. But there's also, I agree with you, there's also a sort of endorsement theory that runs that, that isn't dependent on it being a cake, as I read your briefs, and in, in which case then, a table becomes significant. Any act that is making the wedding possible or showing up at the wedding is then, by how I read your theory, one form of endorsement that is troubling. And I, don't, I can't tell whether you're actually arguing that as a sort of clear ground under the speech and, and religion arguments that you're advancing. I do think that the religion arguments are separate from the free speech arguments, but um, when you go into the, the scenario of the table maker and the level of participation, I think we have to look at what is the test to determine whether there's a free exercise violation, and that test is, is the law neutral or generally applicable? That's how you get to the heightened scrutiny. And as uh, Scott mentioned, in this case, the way you get there quickly and easily is to look at what the state of Colorado has done. Essentially, the state of Colorado has taken the position that if you are a customer, a religious customer, and you want to purchase a cake, a custom cake, that opposes same-sex marriage, you lose. If you are a cake designer and you don't want to create a cake that supports same-sex marriage, 
you lose. So the bottom line denominator here is if you're in Colorado, the viewpoint discrimination and the way they're applying this law is that you lose no matter what if you don't agree with the state's position and you can be compelled to create expression that violates your convictions. So I don't think we can get away from that. And this idea of, well, it's a sign and you're denying you know, service. Um, if you go back and you look at what the state of Colorado said with those bakers that it said, yes, you have the right of free speech not to design this cake, they said, well, look, they serve other people. They serve other Christians and Catholics and other cakes. Well, but Jack Phillips and, and all of our clients, they serve all people as well. It's the message. Throughout Jack's entire career, he's declined to celebrate all kinds of events, not just same-sex marriage. This is just the most recent. And so I think we need to remember that in this debate. It's not the who, it's the event, and it's the expression. And it's also the, the wedding ceremony itself, the spiritual significance of that to Jack. The state has to be even-handed in its treatment of conscience and expression. And otherwise, it violates the free exercise clause, too. If, if I can just jump in here very quickly, I think this is a, especially for people reporting on the case or the optics of the case, I mean, in fact, in this case and also in Arlene's Flowers, Jack Phillips and Baron L. Stutzman would, in fact, serve and sell products to LGBT customers. And in this case, Jack would have sold brownies or cupcakes or whatever he had already made that were in his store for public sale. He would have sold them to the complainants in this case. Or custom cakes, too. He would have even sold custom cakes, provided that it was not expression that was going to be part of the same-sex wedding. Uh, and so all of those facts show that this is not about sexual orientation discrimination. This is, this is far from Romer versus Evans. That was the Justice uh, Kennedy opinion, also coming out of Colorado, that was targeted on sexual orientation discrimination. What this is is about expression for a particular religious ceremony. Uh, two points about that. So I'll just use two examples. So one is to say that you would deny a cake only to a same-sex couple, of course, is about the fact that they're same-sex, right? And that uh, same-sex people, as evidence in the Supreme Court case, have a right to all, one of the, have a right to all of the sort of fundamental aspects of being able to live a life. That's part of the purpose both of Windsor and of Obergefell. It's your analogy. I would just point you back to language from Lawrence. And uh, you know, when Lawrence overruled Bowers, it said, at one point people said, this is about a particular kind of sex. This isn't about the people. And then the, course, the court came back in Lawrence and said, oh, that's preposterous. You can't separate all these things from the status of people, of the people that involved here. So it's hard for me to understand how a same-sex wedding isn't about same-sex people, which is about sexual orientation. Second, it was no excuse in, in, in Bob Jones University. Bob Jones University had a practice of admitting black students. What Bob Jones University did was object to admitting students who said that, who were involved in interracial marriages or advocated and otherwise supported interracial marriages. So you could say, oh, that wasn't a discriminatory policy because the university was willing to admit black students. That's not how we understood Bob Jones University case, nonetheless, in terms of putting forward a form of discrimination that we understood as racial discrimination. Uh, I so think, I think um, the fact that you can, you'll serve some things to people occasionally and not other things based on, on status doesn't get you out of the status discrimination. But he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't serve cakes to, you know, if, you know, pol polygamous marriages were to become legalized. I mean, that's why I, th I mean, look, oh, go read the briefs and, and you can make your own determinations about this. But, uh, uh, but that just shows that it goes, this is about weddings, though. Kristen, just one line and then we'll move on to the next subject because we could go on. Uh, probably for the next hour on this. <laughs> uh, I'll do two quick lines to put an and in. Uh, Obergefell already resolves this. Uh, the suggestion that those who believe marriage is between a man and a woman are compared to those who are engaged in racial bigotry is offensive. That is not what the Bob Jones University case was about. For 50 years, Bob Jones University excluded African Americans from admission. That whole system, the interracial marriage, was a part of an entire system of laws to subjugate a class of people. Marriage between a man and a woman has cut across all civilizations. And the Supreme Court in Obergefell has already said, decent and honorable religious beliefs support this, this belief. And if you compare that to what it said in Loving versus Virginia, it's night and day difference. And that's a distinction that matters. L that was a long sentence. I know, sorry. 
<laughs> that one just gets to me. <laughs> Can I just yeah, add the, the, I think the, the, the race analogy, it's always hard to get away from race analogies in constitutional law, but the, the race analogy to me uh, uh, sort of highlights what the case is about. Are we as a society going to turn every observant Christian, Jew, Muslim into a member of the KKK? I mean, is that how we want to handle this tension in our society? Um, so I hope so. not, but you know, I also watched the confirmation hearing last week where a senator was haranguing a judicial nominee for having spoken to ADF, which he called a hate group, based on positions not dissimilar from the position that we're debating here. So there are parts of our society that are trying to uh, divide us that way. And I, so, I so, think, so I think we'll, we'll have to move on now uh, as we're a bit, uh, running a bit behind, but speak, it's on a similar subject of uh, allegations of uh, religious discrimination. Uh, we're just going to talk quickly about the, the travel ban case, which is something you, you may have heard of. Um, so the su Supreme Court is, is uh, scheduled to hear or oral arguments uh, in October on this, uh, although of course the 90-day ban uh, of uh, people entering the country from uh, six uh, predominantly Muslim countries is, uh, is due to expire on uh, September the 24th is the latest date we've been given. So. Um, I just want to ask Scott, since uh, Texas has also filed a brief in that case, just to um, give us a quick kind of summary of the establishment clause issues in that case, and uh, you know, and then um, I think Yakov maybe will talk about w w whether or not the court will actually get to those questions. Yeah. So the uh, I guess this is the second travel ban uh, case that's being litigated. There was a temporary pause for 90 and 120 days issued by uh, the president through an executive order on uh, individuals from six certain countries coming into the country and also the refugee program. And one of the claims that the plaintiffs have raised against this, there are others, but the main one we'll talk about here is an establishment clause claim in that this is actually a classification in the statute that is intentional discrimination on the basis of religion that even though it's a neutral classification based on the countries that individuals are coming from and the fact that it, they would be you know, part, seeking refugee status, that this is actually pretextual discrimination on the basis of one's uh, membership in the religion of Islam. So this is where the label Muslim ban comes from. Um, there are many problems with the theory that is being raised. Um, but before I get into any of those, I think what the Supreme Court did at the end of last term in allowing the travel ban to go into effect in large part is very indicative of undermining the argument that this is pretextual, intentional religious discrimination. Because if the Supreme Court really thought that this was pretextual religious discrimination, I don't think that nine justices would have allowed most of that ban to go into effect. But the argument here is that even though the statute is just neutral, uh, in particular, President uh, Trump and candidate Trump's statements uh, regarding these topics, the plaintiffs are trying to marshal to say that this is actually a pretext, that there's intentional discrimination here, even though the face of the statute says nothing about Islam or the religion at all. For centuries, for over two centuries, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly that you need a clear and strong showing to have any chance of making out a claim of intentional discrimination. And the court has said over and over again, if there are legitimate reasons for a law, the court is not going to step in and question the motives of the government actors. And I think all those principles, which have been applied in many different contexts since Chief Justice Marshall described them back in 1810, control this case. And I understand that obviously this is a very heated policy disagreement. But the courts are not designed and they should not be used to impugn government actors' motives itself as a basis to have a different policy outcome. That's exactly what the legislative and executive branches are for. And if there's a problem here and you don't believe the president should have this much authority to block people from entering the country, well, that's an issue for Congress. And Congress gave the president all sorts of authority here, essentially, that he can unilaterally block the entry 
um, of aliens who are not uh, residents here. And if that's the issue, then we should be having a conversation about whether Congress should be reasserting its prerogatives rather than talking about intentional discrimination. So just before Yakov weighs in, uh, uh, the ACLU is, the, uh, is representing some of the plaintiffs in this case, although it's not Louise's uh, case. Um, I'll just ask her to quickly uh, give the summary of uh, the ACLU's position on this. So obviously it is a, a theory that you, the Establishment Clause says you can't favor one faith over another, and in this case, nor can you disparage one faith as, as the government, and in this case, Muslims are being disparaged. In terms of the argument about looking to intent, this is intent of government actors does come into play in different kinds of court decisions for sure in terms of the courts do sometimes look at purpose, the court looks at the intent of government actors in certain kinds of discrimination cases, for example. So it is not in any way sort of out of the zone to be looking at the statements and, and pronouncements of government actors in certain occasions. And here I think you, it may be that there is even more basis where it, you're not trying to just look at what Congress thought where you have you know, several hundred members as opposed to what did the executive think. And the other challenge I'm just curious about, which is if you say that the statements of the executive have, could never have a bearing in this way, you, you can readily get yourself to some preposterous result where somebody could say on Tuesday, the president could say on Tuesday, I personally, I have a overwhelming prejudice against name some group and I think our country should be free of ever having any more of that group, and then signs a neutral executive order. It, it's hard for me to imagine, at least in, that, in, in, in something that extreme, that the president's statement would really have zero bearing on the question at hand. So Yakov, what's the court gonna do? <laughs> I like sending I all those questions that way. I didn't know you were the Oracle. I get to sit next to the Oracle. <laughs> well, you had initially asked, you had initially said you were going to ask whether the court is going to reach the question, and I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised after hearing from both sides if they tried to dodge it. Uh, nobody, I don't think anyone here wants to hear about mootness. So, uh, I, I will say this on the merits of the on the merits of that debate, and there are good arguments on both sides. I, I have a feeling that the nail in the coffin for the challengers came very recently with the lawsuits that were filed challenging the rescission of uh, the DACA program. Uh, because one of the theories that the, those challenges rely on is very similar to the theory that the, that the travel ban is being challenged on, which is, well, the president made campaign statements that reflected animus towards uh, Hispanics, and now he's taken this action, and you should infer that the reason he took this action was because of the animus. I think what it really shows and what will, I, I suspect, what it will illustrate to the court is once you open this door, there's no end to the challenges that you could bring and the psychoanalysis that you would be doing of uh, some individuals at the top of the executive branch. Um, and is that really the way we want courts analyzing these things as opposed to, sure, intent matters, I mean, purpose matters, but do you look at purpose by, uh, through that type of methodology, or do you apply tests and standards that are meant to smoke out uh, illicit motives by looking at how the, what the law says, how it functions, uh, and whether it's over-inclusive and under-inclusive, the type of more objective legal analyses that courts uh, have historically used for these purposes. So I think um, some of the recent developments may be helping uh, the administration. And of course, just, there may be exactly. Just add something to that. I think as not having a dog in the fight, one of the things that I, f I found curious is to, to tag onto what you're saying um, is that there's an establishment clause argument rather than going under the free exercise clause. Um, just from looking at the difference in the claims, I'm a whole lot more comfortable with uh, litigating a free exercise clause with established tests without broad remedies where it's a all or nothing and you can consider the state's interest and that whole idea of a single person being able to say something and completely obliterate the law um, doesn't seem like the best way to to navigate our jurisprudence whereas under the free exercise clause it provides the the framework to look at those things so I, I just as an outsider looking in it, it's curious to me that you would advocate for an establishment clause claim as opposed to free exercise, or maybe not. The Beckett brief. Yeah. 
So the odd thing about this mm. case is that everything could change before the uh, argument even takes place. It could be a new ban, could be a, uh, new presidential tweets, uh, <laughs> could be anything. So I think it's one of those unusual cases where we're all going to be keeping a very close eye on things heading into the, uh, the argument. Um, now we're going to move quickly on to some of the uh, petitions that are pending uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, they've got a big pile of them now uh, that have been building up over the summer that they'll be uh, deciding whether to take uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. And uh, I think Kristen um, is going to talk a little bit about um, one of those cases that's on the summer list, uh, which I think ADF is involved in, about the, uh, the uh, pregnancy uh, crisis centers, as they're called, in, in California, and a, a law in California that requires them um, to post signs telling people how they can get uh, abortions and, and contraception and whether that violates free speech. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, in California passed an act that basically forces pro-life uh, licensed medical facilities to have to advertise for abortions and to tell the women that come into their clinics, um, you can go get a low-cost abortion through the state and, and give them the resources to do that in terms of where to go. It, the law also forces unlicensed uh, facilities that are providing resources and help to pregnant women um, to post in an advertisement that they, uh, a number of different things, but essentially that they're not a licensed clinic with medical physicians and so on. And you might not think that's real onerous until you read the fine print, which is in uh, major areas. You may have to post that in 13 different languages and in conspicuous font, which essentially means that pro-life clinics can't advertise at all, can't let anyone know because it's cost prohibitive. And that's, that's what was behind the law. The findings actually say that it's targeted to go after pro-life facilities um, so that they have to refer for abortions and have to provide this information. Um, these laws have been struck down in other, in Austin, Texas, a couple in Maryland, as well as in the Second Circuit in New York. Um, and so in California, the Ninth Circuit uh, applied inappropriate standards. They did not apply strict scrutiny, even though it's a content and a viewpoint-based law under the free speech clause. Um, they applied a lower standard. And in addition, um, I think a, a critical issue, just even bigger than this issue, is what kind of speech can the government compel? Similar to the masterpiece scenario, can the government tell medical professionals what they must say when it's not even related to their expertise or knowledge? Um, just under some vague state interest of, we think it's in the health of our citizens for you to tell them this. Um, if this ruling is upheld, uh, potentially that is, that's, that's what's at stake. Uh, is this one that uh, the ACLU is involved in too, or not? We have not filed in this case at all, as I understand it. And, and I have not read the decision recently, but I know the kinds of questions people ask in these cases, right? So one, I think one is, is there any kind of factual record of a need for people to be told, provided some information? So I think I know that some of the advocacy around crisis pregnancy centers, the, the non-licensed ones, at least talks about people looking like doctors. And so if people think they're coming in to see a doctor, they should know it's not a doctor. And then is there any record of people being misled? And then that as to some of the the statements, the, the statement says, as I recall, you know, there's California provides services for family planning, prenatal care, and abortions, including for low-income people. And if you want help, here, call this number or something like that. It's not just abortions. It's, it's prenatal care, contraception, and abortion. I know that some of the people who defend the law say that then it's really requiring a posting of nothing other than what it would be required as a matter of medical ethics. The only problem is they exempt from the whole law the clinics that are actually providing abortions, so that's kind of a telltale sign that it is a viewpoint content-based uh, law. And in addition, there is no factual record that would support these unlicensed clinics, you know, being suggested they're somehow deceptive in their practices. So yes, you can say that, not you, but I mean, they can say that in the law, but there's no factual record to support it. So, uh, Yakov, any thoughts so. on whether the court might take that issue up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they'll take the case, but I do know that the, the justices tend to be much more favorably inclined toward uh, compelled speech claims and co com even commercial speech claims 
uh, then the courts of appeals tend to be. So I think if they took the case, it would be a very good sign for the challengers. But it's been, I mean, there are compelled speech cases, for example, coming in the context of abortion clinics. There's a lot of speech required of physicians who provide abortion. There's required speech, mandated speech, for example, to provide booklets with brochures and to provide lists of all local places that provide services for women who want to carry to term as, as, and others in the court. There's at least in, in Casey, the court was right. the, dismissed the compelled speech um, claim in like two sentences or something. There, there's a professional speech sort of doctrine, yes. sort of a subpart yes. of this, but it sounds like the law applies to non-professionals. It applies so to that's both, it's both, right? It's that's what's interesting both. about this particular petition is because it has both. It has licensed and non-licensed, and so in the licensed context, there's a, a key issue that I think is very intriguing, which is can the state compel professionals to give advice and give um, information that would violate their, their ethical obligations, that they feel would violate their ethical obligations, just because the state says, well, this is in the interest of our citizens. And Cato and others have filed briefs in that case to say, this is a very, very dangerous standard that you're setting, to let the state tell the doctor what he or she ought to say. Does this mean you're going to join the ACLU in the compelled speech cases on behalf of the clinics that provide abortions? Well, you send that my way and we'll consider it. <laughs> well, that's the question I was going to ask uh, Scott, because obviously states have lots of different reasons for passing laws. Um, we do. And uh, <laughs> you, one could imagine a Texas passing a law that uh, the ACLU wouldn't like uh, that might compel people to speak. Or, or, or Can't so. imagine Is it. this a sort of issue that could uh, lead to some uh, odd bedfellows if the court was to take it up? Well, I think one of the reasons I think you all have asserted your circuit split, you know, the primary reason the Supreme Court takes a case is because there's a conflict of authority in the lower courts. And I think some of the cases that you all have cited have dealt with not only the situations with pregnancy centers that are pro-life, but also mm -hmm. what can a state tell doctors that they must say. And so, so I think all these issues are going to kind of come up in the context of uh, the questions in this case. Right. There are uh, other compelled Sorry. There are other contexts in which compelled speech is being litigated similarly, the right? The, I want to say the whether doctors, what's the gun scenario? The 11th Circuit case. Yeah. 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 So uh, just quickly, we've got another couple of minutes before we go to questions. Any other uh, cert petitions pending on the sort of issues that our audience here are interested in that we should be keeping an eye out for? I do think the Neely petition is um, interesting. I don't know if you, did you want to talk about that? or I, Happy I'm, to. I'm, okay, go, go for it. Okay. Take it away. Um, Neely, actually just yesterday, the Supreme Court asked for a response in that. Um, and Neely involves a Wyoming judge that had two positions, a part-time magistrate position as well as another judicial position. One, she did not do, did not have the discretion to perform weddings, the magistrate position she did if she wanted to. And the Wyoming, without any complaint, without any request even to do a same-sex marriage, um, she was asked by a reporter what her thoughts were on it, said she would refer to someone else to do those weddings. And the Wyoming Judicial Commission um, tried to actually remove her from both positions, saying that she was biased and unfit to serve on the bench. Um, that went up to the Wyoming Supreme Court, and there's a petition pending right now at the U.S. Supreme Court. The Wyoming Supreme Court said she could keep her position that didn't have any discretion to do weddings, but she needed to lose the other one, essentially, um, because if you had beliefs on marriage and you dared to speak those beliefs, you were biased against an entire class of people. Um, and the implications of that, not just for the compelled speech claims, but also just for those who want to serve on the bench in the future, um, as the Amy Coney Barrett situation came up recently, are, are really troubling. Um, so I was glad to see that the Supreme Court was asking for a response. Uh, any other cases quickly that, to keep an eye out for? I'll briefly flag the city of Bloomfield versus Felix, the establishment clause 10 commandments case. Uh, this is also another uh, ADF case, but we and the state of Texas filed an amicus brief on behalf of 23 states. So we almost got half. The 23 <laughs> states saying, Supreme Court, in 2005, you had a pair of cases dealing with when can a, when can a Ten Commandments statute properly be displayed um, on government property. And in Texas, the ruling in our decision was, yes, the Ten Commandments statute in Texas could remain, but in Kentucky, it had to come down. And the court did a very fact-bound, contextualized analysis uh, of looking at the particular historical circumstances of both of these. But even as the court was issuing these opinions at the same time, there was tension between the two of them, and the court almost kind of created its own split 
on that day about Ten Commandments statues. And so this case is asking the court in the context of a case coming out of New Mexico, can you please you know, elucidate what you meant by how we should deal with these two different cases? Uh, and b because of that, the fact that also multiple lower courts have said, I think Judge Easterbrook famously said that yeah, if the legislature had created this body of law, it would be found unconstitutionally vague. Uh, when you have lower courts signaling to the Supreme Court that they really need to uh, fix that, I think there's a good chance that the court's going to take and, a hard look at that. And, and I think there's a sleeper issue in that one too, right, which is standing, right? right? Who can right. challenge these uh, displays and monuments? It's a bit hard to come up with a test that isn't going to be fact-bound when you're talking about yes. displays yes. in parks or that type of thing. But if you adopted a rule that limited standing, uh, and took away the ability of people to sue just because they were offended from seeing the display, uh, that would basically kill off this entire area of litigation um, without creating a new test. So that's uh, uh, something to really watch out for. Well, one of the ironies in this case is uh, at least one of those litigants has never even read the monument. Uh, they just drive by it. So uh, I think that's what makes the standing issue even more interesting. <laughs> Right, uh, well, thanks a lot for that. Um, we've got about um, 15 minutes uh, exactly for questions, uh, and I think there may be microphones going around. Um, in the front here, first. Well, thank you so much to all of you for being on this panel. I found it very interesting. Um, my question is for you, Louise. General Keller raised an interesting point um, with regards to painters. And if, you know, should a painter be forced by the state you know, to be commissioned to paint something of a ceremony that goes against her conscience or that she'd prefer not to be a part of? So I guess my question is, and you mentioned you know, if you're open to the public, obviously the painter would be offering her paintings to the public as part of her business. So should the state be allowed to compel that painter um, to paint something that she'd prefer not to? To paint. I think this goes back to the, the sort of message versus person in some sense, right? So you don't have to make the cake that says, I love gay couples or I love the Nazis. And there I'm assuming that Nazi isn't a, a creed because um, I know that is in, that's in a footnote in somebody's brief. So I just want to say that. Um, as distinct from, can I refuse to serve somebody? So you're the painter and you're offering paintings. You can't if you have opened your doors to the public and you're a public accommodation, you're doing commerce and serving the public, say, I would do a commission painting for you except that you are Christian, or I will do a painting for you except for the fact that you are gay or so you're saying, so you're saying if, if a painter's asked to paint a painting, say, of a same-sex wedding, and they don't want to paint that religious ceremony, the government could still come in and tell them, yes, you do, in fact, have to go in and paint this ceremony. So the ceremony on the, so some of these situations that, that get between message and identity become somewhat murkier. I will, of course, I'm, I'm not, I'm not naive, become murkier, right? So if you're not otherwise, did you realize this was going to be a moot for your argument? <laughs> I'm, I'm not arguing. And he's going to tell you how it's going to come out. I'm just not. <laughs> if that were, I think if you, this is, I think it would depend a little bit more on the facts in terms of whether that then is that you are turning away people because they're gay as opposed to but that was a problematic scenario. Well, so I think, for yeah, sure. I'm if you're painting, if you're doing wedding portraitures in general, and then you, so if you're doing wedding portraitures in general, and then you say, but I won't do it because you're gay, then that is discrimination against you because you're gay. I guess I'm just sort of thinking more about the content of the message or the event you're being asked to do. In this sense, I would imagine that, you know, the painter, say, let's, let's assume that the painter would be happy to paint the couple, you know, in other contexts, it has nothing to do with their homosexuality or their, you know, what, how they identify. It would be simply because of the event, or you know, another thing that comes to mind. You know, if I don't, maybe I'm pro-life, or maybe I don't want to, you know, paint something that's going to violate my conscience, or paint someone and go experiencing having an abortion or something like that. I, I'm just sort of trying to understand, because to me, the line is the line you're proposing does seem a little bit murky and a little bit frightening to empower the state to be able to dictate what I, as a painter, can be commissioned to do and what I can't be, what I can, what what requests I can 
accept and what requests I can decline. So, so in general, anti-discrimination laws were passed in particular so that people who had been subject to discrimination, had been second-class citizens, didn't, couldn't participate freely in civic life, whether that's staying in a hotel or whether that's being served or whether that's getting a job, had all of a sudden had a shot. And to have that shot, there were then rules so that you couldn't discriminate against people so as to level the field. So part of this is when you think about, I think even if you don't, when you talk about dignity, even if you don't agree with me, I think you'll at least understand that if you have been subject to discrimination and you haven't had a right to be married, you haven't had a right to be recognized as equal, you haven't had a right always to go into stores, that if you go in and somebody says to you, I, I realize this is the happiest day of your life, but I, do, I can't do this because of who you are. And that who you are is the thing that has held you back for so long. At minimum, you are going to walk out of that store reminded that you were a second-class citizen. You're going to be reminded that the society, the public spaces, these particular public places of commerce, can still treat you as different. When I talk to Debbie Munn, Debbie Munn is the mother of Charlie, of Charlie and Dave are the couple. Debbie Munn says that when they walked out after being denied the cake, Charlie broke down in the car on the way home because he felt like he was, he was made to feel ashamed of who he was. And that their day that should have been one of their happiest, her words are, we left broken. That's true whether what it is that somebody's selling in the store is a custom-made cake or what they're selling is a cupcake or what you're selling is a space or it's flowers. That feeling of rejection, that feeling of not being able to move is different. And Debbie will say that her son and his husband shop differently. They, they are more anxious when they go shopping now because, they've been, because they were rejected. Okay, next question. Uh, the lady in the middle there. Thank you all. Um, I had a question about the compelled speech abortion. Um, well, you brought up the abortion clinic cases and then obviously the um, pregnancy crisis center cases are related. And I'm not an expert on the compelled speech doctrine at all. But I thought that there was something, um, there was a color to that jurisprudence about the speech that's being compelled being something you don't want to communicate because you oftentimes, in the cases of the Pregnancy Crisis Center, object out of um, religious beliefs or conscience. And so I was wondering how much that's coming up in the arguments. And maybe a question for Louise is, I, 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 I was very uh, kind of uh, curious about the, the comparison of equating the compelled speech in both circumstances. Because in the Pregnancy Crisis Center situation, the, the speech being compelled abortion services is something they object to and that they oppose. Um, whereas I'm wondering, are, you, are your clients for the abortion clinic saying that they're opposed and they object to adoption? Because that's the speech that's being offered there. And does that make a difference in these cases when it comes to the law under compelled speech? Well, I would say when, it, when we're talking about the law of viewpoint discrimination and content discrimination is critical into the, in the analysis. And in the NIFLA case, there's both. There are problems with the content and that they have to specifically discuss and advertise for abortion. And the viewpoint is, um, as you brought up, there's nothing about adoption that they're you know, talking about. And it's clearly just abortion and only applied against pro-life clinics. Also, as you brought up, the compelled speech piece of it is, yes, they have an objection to advertising for abortion clinics and, and the state abortion services. So um, I think the compelled speech, just in and of itself, and the subject matter is very strong. And also the question of, should a professional be required to disclose those sorts of things that they don't believe ethically they should be doing. Um, and I, I just want to go back to one other piece uh, before we, we move on, which is um, the day in, Ju in July of 2012 when Charlie and Dave came into that store. Because what Jack will tell you is it's one of the worst days of his life. And there are very few days that go by where he's not also broken up over it. Um, he wants to serve everyone. It's in his interest to do so. And yes, I don't doubt that Charlie and Dave were hurt by that interaction. There's no question in my mind, and that's very unfortunate, and it's sad that they had to, had to have that happen to them. But we're asking Jack to sin against God, to potentially permanently impair his relationship with God, and to give up his livelihood and his business. 
Charlie and David got their cake pretty much right in the same neighborhood, their rainbow layered cake, and they've moved on and they can live consistent with their values. But we're telling Jewish, Muslim, uh, Sikh, uh, Christian, Protestant, Catholic designers that they have to violate the core of who they are. And if this is about identity, identity has to go both ways. So we're just asking for balance and tolerance in an inclusive society. Next question. Oh, I didn't, I didn't get to answer this oh, question. Go ahead. So the compelled Quickly. speech, so Casey involved a question, for example, of giving booklets that identified, that showed pictures of fetal development at every stage. And yes, we did, the clinics, we did, it was an ACLU case, objected to mandating that doctors have to provide that in every case. And the cases now, most often sort of in the compelled speech, um, are often, con some of them are contested for truth as to whether or not abortion causes breast cancer that you shouldn't require a doctor to say something that a doctor thinks is not true and has evidence, documents to, to establish and, and other messages that are, um, I would say, more political than a referral. The, 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 You don't have to be morally opposed, though, to bring a First Amendment speech claim, right? You just have to not want to do it for whatever reason. And, and I'm not saying they do or don't, but, but that, that really shouldn't make the difference. You wouldn't get the challenge if the person was happy to provide the information. So presumably the person who's being forced to say something doesn't want to do it for whatever reason. And the test that the court has used for, at least for certain commercial disclosures, asks whether the um, required speech is purely factual and uncontroversial. So a lot of the debate ends up turning on, well, what does controversial mean? Do you mean that the controversy surrounds its truth, or do you mean controversial in a different sense, political or social controversy? And, uh, next question. If, um, is it up here in the back, in the middle? Um, so I have two uh, brief questions, one for the uh, solicitor. Um, <coughs> you mentioned that it would be really bad precedent if the government began questioning the motives behind a law. Um, and my immediate thought is similar to Louise's thought, which is that the motive, when the, does the, does the clarity of the motive um, matter? For example, if it could be argued that the motive was very clear that this was meant to discriminate against Muslims because of previous statements, would that, how does that affect your argument? And my question for Louise is not to belabor the point, but to put into focus a little bit more. Um, the, the previous questioner asked about whether or not uh, the wedding portrait. Uh, so to, if you could speak specifically to the point of whether or not the wedding portrait, if the, if the painter said, well, I'd be happy to paint you two in any other context than a wedding portrait, would that be less about the who and more about the what? So those are my two questions. Sure. So on the, the issue of how you do this purpose analysis, the Supreme Court said is you only look at purpose or motives in very narrow instances where the court has said you should. Uh, racial discrimination is a good example. Yes, you can look at motives when you're bringing a claim of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can bring a purpose-based challenge to any type of claim. In the Establishment Clause, the court, I believe, has said in one of the Ten Commandments case that you can probably bring one of these types of purpose claims. Okay, so now we have said you can bring that type of claim in this type of case. The court has then said, though, even if you can bring this type of claim, and this, I think, was Jakob's point, there's a presumption of constitutionality and good faith and regularity. And you have to look at the motive through that lens. In other words, there is a weight on the scale that is saying that what the government is doing is presumptively constitutional. And so to answer your question, if you had the level of evidence to uh, overcome that strong, the court has called it a strong and heavy presumption, then you possibly could have a case in which that uh, challenge could be sustained. But I think it also is going to depend not only just on statements, but also how the law actually operates in effect. And here, clearly, I mean, the six countries identified were identified by Congress and the Obama administration long before the Trump administration came up as countries of concern regarding terrorism. 
So one thing to remember here is if you think about either the test that you guys are advocating or the test, for example, of the Solicitor General in terms of whether it's expression as in the custom-made product or whether it's expression as in the event, and in particular an event that often has very strong religious resonance for people, that won't in any way be limited to a wedding. So for example, a funeral, um, you can I don't understand why the same theory wouldn't apply, for example, to the florist who is solicited by Jim Obergefell um, for flowers for the funeral of his husband in the sense that that is, that is about marking their relationship and it is, a, is it a creative event. So I wouldn't be, I think I want to caution everybody that I, res, I understand how folks are trying to, for, as you said, for the way that happens in the Supreme Court, argue a limiting principle because, A, because you believe it because it's also a better way to win. Um, but even the limiting principles are not, it's, it's not just flowers and it's not just a wedding. It's, I think there's involved in this argument a question about endorsement, there's a question about all expressive goods, and then at least for the Solicitor General, there's a, there's a further narrowing in terms of, of events. I feel pretty confident and, to, in predicting that both sides will get very tough hypotheticals. That absolutely. Push the boundaries absolutely. Of their yes. So but, but I think, you know, what does it mean to say that the most important event for many people's, you're ta you, your briefs say it themselves in terms of how important a wedding is to people, expressive for people involved, expressive for the couple getting married, to say that for that most important event, we as a nation would say that you can turn people away, that you can discriminate in public places and treat people differently based on suspect categories. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, the gentleman in the front. Uh, this is this is for uh, Kristen. Uh, can you talk about briefly DACA uh, mm -hmm. this issue? Taka, uh, mm -hmm. I, I am uh, against it. <laughs> you want me to take it? <laughs> well, I'll say this: I could talk about that, but I think you probably do better to hear from Solicitor General on that, as he's much more involved in those issues than ADF is. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the state of Texas, with 25 other states, led the challenge to DAPA, D-A-P-A, which was the follow-on program to the 2012 DACA program. Uh, both programs, what the uh, president was trying to do was unilaterally, without congressional authority, confer lawful presence and work authorization um, to, uh, well, 1 million or over 1 million, and then the next program about over 4 million, otherwise unlawfully present aliens. Um, and so we blocked the 2014 program through litigation. Uh, and then litigation was threatened over the 2012 DACA program. And recently, uh, within the past few weeks, the administration then had agreed to wind down the DACA program. Um, and that was what the states had asked for. And so we pulled our lawsuit. and. and because they had satisfied the demands of the settlement letter, essentially, that we sent. Now, in response to all that, though, uh, 19 other states in the District of Columbia have now sued the executive branch, saying, no, you can't wind down DACA. Um, and one of the great ironies of this is, in their pleadings, they are affirmatively saying things such as, well, DACA confers substantive rights. And this confers eligibility for Medicare and Social Security. And it's like all the arguments we were making for years that they were kicking and screaming that we were just, no, this is just prosecutorial discretion. There's nothing to see here. And, and so they're almost pleading their way out of court um, in the sense that if DACA was unlawful to begin with because it conferred substantive rights and didn't go through the proper procedures, well, of course, the government should be able to pull that immediately. Uh, so this is going to be obviously, though, ongoing litigation on this. And also, Arizona has a, a cert petition before the Supreme Court that's somewhat raising this issue because Arizona tried to deny driver's licenses to DACA recipients. And the Ninth Circuit said that federal law preempted that. But the problem with that theory is even if you disagree with us in our position, even if you think this is just prosecutorial discretion, it was simply about not deporting, if it's just enforcement in action, 
that cannot possibly be a congressional statute that preempts a state's ability to structure any of its programs. And so either way you have that, I think Arizona has very strong arguments there um, on that preemption case. But as far as where DACA is going, um, it's going to depend on these various lawsuits that are still going to be uh, standing out there. And uh, we may not have filed our last brief on this issue. And I guess one other little irony is that the state's suing the, the government over DACA would be citing your case as to why they have standing. Every time they cite the standing in nationwide injunction, uh, we should like start a little tip jar or something in the office. <laughs> <laughs> but look, we were right on that, and, and I get it. it look, they, they are perfectly within their rights to come to court and say, yeah, we took other positions, but you know what? Texas was right about that. And if they want to say Texas was right in that regard, we welcome them. <laughs> okay, I think uh, that just about wraps things up. I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll reconvene for round two of the masterpiece battle at the Supreme Court, <laughs> probably in early December. So we'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. That was great. Thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, feel free to get some more lunch and uh, grab some of our panelists and continue the conversation. Thank you so much.